Hi, welcome back to Computer Science Theory. This is Tom's W3261, offered summer B 2021 at Columbia University. And this is lecture four. So today we're gonna to be showing how to convert NFAs to regular expressions. We're gonna be talking about non-regular languages and a sort of complicated but very useful tool called the pumping lemma. Um, I'm gonna offer a teaser at the beginning of this lecture. This is something you want to, you can pause the video and puzzle about. If you wanna think about regular expressions some more as we get going. Question is, um, what concept, what language is captured by this regular expression? I'll try to remember to give the answer sometime later. This. And the alphabet is just decimals. So announcements for today. Uh, homework number two is due on 7-12 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. That's Monday at midnight Eastern. So if you're watching this on Monday, it's due today. If you're watching this on Tuesday, it's due yesterday. And you've got one, day, one late day use. Uh, homework number two is a short homework, but homework number three will be back to normal with, I think, four proofs, and it'll be due on the 19th, that is next Monday at 11.59 as well. The readings that correspond to this lecture are Sipser, end of section, 1.3 and section 1.4. So we'll be finishing up chapter one today. Um, we'll have thoroughly grounded you in the regular and non regular languages. And after this, we'll get to move on to even bigger and better and more powerful language classes. That's something to look forward to. Uh, today, on the agenda, we're going to start with a quick review of last week. So everything we did uh, in lecture three. Um, and then, let's see, we already showed that we can take any regular expression and turn it into an NFA. Right, we did that by um, recursively building up an NFA that matched our inductive definition of a regular expression. So we made little NFAs for our base cases, NFAs that recognized single symbols and the empty set and the language containing the empty string. And then we showed that if we could build NFAs for small regular expressions, we could then, following our same proofs for closure under the regular operations, um, combine those NFAs to create NFAs for any regular expression. So what we'll do today, uh, we'll show that any NFA can be converted into a regular expression that describes the same language recognized by the NFA. So this will complete the proofs 
that a language is described by some regular expression, if and only if it's recognized by some NFA. In other words, it will complete the proof that the languages described by regular expressions are precisely the regular languages. So we have equivalents between our three um, ways of expressing or recognizing languages, NFAs, DFAs, and regular expressions. So we'll finish that proof. Um, it'll be an interesting sort of proof because it'll require us to introduce a new automaton, not even a, well, not even a fundamental automaton, just one that we're defining for the purposes of this proof that makes our lives easier. So there used to be these terrifying machines and now we're just bragging them in to finish our proofs with. Uh, after we talk about that, we'll take a little break and then we'll talk about non-regular languages. So of course, so far we've talked a lot about how do we prove a language is regular. We've built up a toolkit of ways to doing that with the regular operations, regular expressions, NFAs, DFAs. Um, but of course there are some languages that are not regular, that cannot be recognized by the tools we have. And we haven't thought about proving that a language isn't regular. It's a little bit tricky to prove a negative. It's not impossible in math, but we need to have a way to show um, that no DFA or no NFA or no regular expression can recognize a language, and that'll show that it's non-regular. And we'll start talking about some of the tricky properties, some of the complexity that can exist in languages that makes them non-regular. And then finally, we'll introduce this thing called the pumping lemma. And this is a tool for proving non-regularity. Um, it's a little bit technical, but effectively what the pumping lemma says is that all regular languages have a certain specific property. So if we can prove that a language doesn't have this property, then it must not be regular. So that is our agenda for the day. All right. So from last week, we know that regular languages, languages are regular if and only if they're recognized by some DFA, if and only if they're recognized by some NFA. If you recall, that was our proof where we took an NFA and we created a much larger DFA that uh, simulated our NFA. Our DFA had states for every set of states in the NFA. And we're going to add one more this set of equivalences today. We also showed regular languages are closed under union, concatenation, and star. So in particular, we had three NFA constructions that let us take generic NFAs and turn them into new NFAs that recognize union languages, concatenated languages, and um, starred languages. So let's see, this was our union. We had two epsilon edges, so we'd simulate both languages at once. This is our concatenation. We had epsilon edges connecting the accept states of one NFA to the beginning of another NFA. And then we also had a star construction where we created epsilon edge loops from the end of the beginning. So we recognized strings multiple times. And we also created a little bonus state to ensure that we accepted the empty string. So that was our, those are high level pictures of our constructions, how we proved union concatenation of the star. Um, wanted to make a side note. 
because this was an excellent point brought up in class. And um, it's not a major proof in the textbook. I think it's an exercise, but I also think it's worth knowing. And the note is that the regular, regular languages are closed under set complements. And what I mean by set complement is, suppose we have some alphabet. So any language is a subset of strings on that alphabet, which we now know how to write with regular expressions. Um, so any language um, over this alphabet is a subset of sigma star, right? Applying the star operation to the set of symbols um, that creates all the possible strings. So set complement we define for a language A, A with a bar over it, is all strings over that alphabet, except the ones that are in A. That's set complement. And we can see that regular languages are closed under set complement by swapping the accept reject states of a DFA that recognizes A so why does this work why can I take a DFA for the language A and swap the accept and reject states to recognize the complement well one property of a DFA that recognizes A is that whenever I put in a string that's in A, I end up at an accept state. And we're thinking DFA here. So we have one computational path. That computational path will end up at an accept, accept state after reading in all input symbols, if and only if it's an accepting string. Likewise, we'll end up at a reject state if it's a rejecting string. If we've swapped the accept and reject, reject states, we ensure that we have a DFA that recognizes the exact complement of A over the set of strings in the alphabet, sigma. So this is a side note. Um, and this is a new fact you can use on a homework or some future thing if you would like to. Um, but it's a, it's a little bit of an easier proof. It doesn't require any of the machinery that we've used previously. It's just a note because I've had this question a few times. Uh, what else did we do yesterday? We learned that regular expressions describe or evaluate to languages. We use the regular expressions, sorry, the regular operations to build them up from base cases. So for example, one union zero is evaluated as the language containing the string one union with the language containing the string zero, which is just the language containing one and zero. Uh, zero one star. Well, that's the language containing the string zero one repeated some number of times. Um, 
zero union one concatenated with one. Remember, we just assume concatenation if we put two languages next to each other in a regular expression. Well, that's zero, one, and one, one, right? This language at the top, one, zero, concatenated with a one at the end. Uh, we also had this symbol, meaning every symbol in uh, the alphabet. So if you see a sigma, you know, plug in exactly one symbol in the alphabet sigma. We had a plus. Um, where plus r plus equals r r star. Uh, we had this, the empty string signifies the language containing the empty string and the null symbol signifies the empty language. Um, I wanted to clarify a couple of things really quickly. just in case there was any lingering confusion on this point. When I talked about order of operations the other day, I said, um, first, you do the star operation. Second, you do the concatenation operation. And third, you do the union. Uh, just to be clear, Uh, the first operation you do is star and plus. And the reason is that R plus is just shorthand for R, R star. So in other words, whenever you see a plus, you can just immediately replace it with um, the symbol and then the symbol star. Or you can also just evaluate it at the same time as star. The other thing I wanted to note is that parentheses always comes first. So the logic behind always doing parentheses first is the same as when you have another formal system for building up expressions. Like in arithmetic, you're probably familiar. If I write A um, plus B times C, this is equal to uh, B times C plus A. Basically, I do the multiplication first. Multiplication comes first in the order of operations. But if I write A plus B, times C, the parentheses tell me, evaluate the thing in the parentheses first. Um, that should be treated as its own unit. And if there's ever any ambiguity in a regular expression, you're welcome to write extra parentheses. There's no harm in doing that. So um, parentheses group things first, and plus is just a gloss for star. So hopefully that makes that clear. Um, the last thing we did last week was we showed that any regular expression can be converted to an NFA. And I figured I'd just quickly do another example of this conversion because I know these conversion processes are um, they're important to get right. There's a lot of fiddly steps, and sometimes just seeing examples over and over uh, can make you more confident in doing it. And also, you know, it's a good way to practice our regular operation closure groups. So, for example, suppose we have the regular expression 0, 1, star, um, 1, union, empty string. Um, we're going to show how to create an NFA that recognizes precisely the same language that this regular expression evaluates to. And how we're going to do that is we're going to start with the most basic chunks. So our primitives. Uh, we'll always start with little NFAs that recognize zero and one. I claim that these are the base cases that recognize just zero and just one. 
And then uh, I'll also write down, we're using a third base case this time. We've also got the base case that accepts the empty string, which is just this little NFA. Um, as you can see, you've got the empty string. Uh, you start at the start state, you accept on the empty string, but if there are any other symbols in your string, as soon as you read one, your last branch of computation dies. So these are our base cases. And now we just use the regular uh, operation gadgets to build up to the entire regular expression. So for example, uh, the zero one is in the parentheses. So I'll evaluate it first. This is zero concatenated with one. So I'll write out my two gadgets. And then I will do the concatenation operation. That is, I'll create an epsilon edge from the accept state of my first gadget to the start state of my next gadget. And I'll make sure I don't accept on just something that fits my first gadget. Um, in this particular case, I can condense my gadget. So this is not strictly required, but it'll mean I have to draw more states in the future. Sorry, fewer states in the future. Uh, I've just removed the epsilon edge because in this case, it's not changing the computation from this simpler compound. All right. Similarly, we can take our zero one gadget and turn it into zero one star. So that's our zero one. Um, how we do the star operation? Well, we make epsilon edges from every accept state to the start state. We also add a state at the beginning connected to the start state by an epsilon edge to ensure we accept the empty string. Um, now that we know zero star one, we can evaluate this language concatenated with one, which I'm just gonna make my life easier. I'm gonna draw it on the same diagram, but I'm gonna use purple. So we have our NFA that accepts one up here. It looks like this. And to concatenate, we'll just draw epsilon edges from the accept states of the NFA recognizing our first expression to the start state of our second expression. And again, we'll make sure the accept states of our first expression are no longer accept states. And of course, let's make a union with the empty string. Uh, we'll do our union operation here. So what is our union operation? Well, that's the one where we have um, a gadget that allows us to run two NFAs simultaneously. So in particular, we can just add, um, our epsilon gadget up here. That looks right. And then we can start with a new state that epsilon transitions to our start state at the beginning of the execution. So now we're effectively running in parallel on the NFA that recognizes only the empty string and the NFA that recognizes zero, one, star, one. So that's how we can build up um, our NFA that's equivalent to this regular expression in this case, there may be further simplification here. So on a homework problem, this could be step one. Uh, and step two might be take a hard look at this, test some strings, think about where various strings are gonna end up after they evaluate and boil it down further. It's quite possible this is a simpler language than it appears. So this is, that's our review for the day. And the next section we're gonna show, I may have said NFAs earlier. We're actually gonna show how to convert DFAs 
to regular expressions. Of course, technically, it's also a proof of how to convert NFAs to regular expressions because we can convert NFAs to DFAs. Um, and once we show this, we'll have the following theorem. A language is regular if and only if some regular expression evaluates to that language. And this follows from two lemmas, essentially both parts of the if and only if. So lemma one, any regular expression as an equivalent NFA. And of course, we proved this last time. We just saw an example of converting um, a regular expression to an NFA. It remains to prove lemma two, which is that any DFA has an equivalent regular expression. All right, uh, why does this imply our theorem? Well, uh, if some regular expression evaluates to a language, then that language must be regular because we can convert it into an NFA that recognizes the language. Similarly, um, if a language is regular, we know by definition there's a DFA that recognizes it, and we can convert that DFA uh, into an equivalent regular expression. So our proof idea. Hopefully it's familiar right now that when we're trying to show that anything of anything of one type has an equivalent object of another type, we start with the generic object. So prove this. We'll start with some DFA. Then we'll convert our DFA to a new kind of automaton called a GNFA, that is a generalized non-deterministic finite automaton, which has a convenient structure. So, right, we'll start with some generic DFA. We'll show how to convert our generic DFA to a new kind of automaton that we'll describe. This automaton will recognize the same language as the DFA. And the reason we're doing this intermediate step is because our new kind of automaton has a convenient structure that will make it easier to go from that automaton to a regular expression. So in particular, there's a specific procedure that will let us boil down our GNFA to equivalent regular expression. Sound good? So let's introduce the GNFA. Um, and this will be, yeah, we'll do this introduction. 
Uh, we'll see why the GNFA is a little bit inconvenient for practical use, uh, but we'll have it as our theoretical tool. And um, it's a great example of a time, a type of automaton, which is conveniently written formally uh, and where our formal five tuples start to become handy. Uh, and where pictures start to not fail us, but um, start to become tricky to read. So GNFAs to a first approximation are like NFAs, but with transitions labeled by regular expressions. I've seen some people experimenting with things like this on the homework. So hopefully this will gratify you if you've had this thought. We always transition on a single symbol when we're think thinking about DFAs or NFAs, but why do we have to do that? Why can't we transition on some other pattern? Uh, and GNFAs will allow us to do this. So actually gonna scroll down so I'm past the page break and draw a picture of a GNFA. So let's say we've got some start state, uh, a couple more states here. We should have an accept state. And then I'm gonna draw in a bunch of edges that can have regular expressions as their labels. So let's say on the alphabet, sigma equals a, b, we might have a GNFA that looks like this. Edge on a, b star, an uh, edge on a star, an edge on a, a star, edge on a, a. We can use unions. We could have an edge on A, B, union B, A, B star. We can even have edges on the empty set, which if you remember is a valid regular expression. Might seem like a trivial edge because we're not gonna match the pattern of the empty set. We're not gonna see a string. It's the empty language. So a GNFA might look like that. Got a lot of edges. Um, some of them are regular expressions. And in addition to the obvious modification from an NFA that um, that we can have regular expressions as edge labels, I'm gonna add another special rule which again is a special rule. It's a little bit arbitrary, but I'm using it for convenience and it'll become convenient when we later use this as part of our proof. So the special rule is as follows. Um, exactly one start and end state. You start and you accept. Um, one transition between, so this is exactly one transition between every pair, I'll write exactly just to be clear, exactly one transition between every pair of states, except the start state, which will have no incoming transitions. And the accept state, no outgoing transitions. So 
So I've restricted my GNFAs a little bit and my picture still matches this special rule intentionally. So whenever we have a GNFA, we have one place we start, that's normal, uh, but we only have one accept state. So we can just call that state to accept. Uh, there's no worries about confusing it with multiple other accept states. Um, and our transitions, um, I may have broken one transition rule. I had two transitions going between those two states. I meant to draw this the other direction. Um, our transitions are almost a complete directed graph, meaning for every pair of states, there should be an edge going from A to B and an edge going from B to A. Um, I'll say every ordered pair of states just to make that clear. So if I have two states, Q1 and Q2, there should be an edge from Q1 to Q2 and one from Q2 to Q1. Um, so one transition between every ordered pair, except for the start state, which doesn't have any incoming transitions, and the accept state, which doesn't have any outgoing transitions. So in a way, we're always moving away from the start and toward the accept. So those are our special rules when defining a GNFA. Now that we have our picture, we can do it formally. And this will be a good old automaton definition with a big tuple. So a GNFA is a five tuple. And that five tuple is Q, sigma, delta, Q start, and Q accept, where Q is a finite set of states. Uh, sigma is finite alphabet. Um, our transition function, well, our transition function now um, is going to go from a pair of states And it's going to label each ordered pair of states with a regular expression R. So curly R is the set of all regular expressions on sigma. So this might look a little weird. In particular, our transition function has always been something that told us what to do if we were imitating our automaton. On a DFA, our transition function told us, if you're at a certain state and you get a certain symbol, here's where you go. Similarly for an NFA, it told us, if you're at a certain state and you get a set, certain symbol, here is the set of states that you go to. This transition function has a different form um, that I want to point out. It essentially, oh, excuse me, I've written acceptance at the start here. There we go. It'll give us a pair of states. So uh, in particular, we'll start at any state except the accept state, because the accept state has no outgoing transitions by assumption and we'll end at any state except the start state because the start state has no incoming transitions by assumption. And it'll label that pair of states, edge between them, which exists by assumption, because we've said every ordered pair has exactly one edge with a regular expression. It's a labeling function, not an instruction of how to move around. And that's gonna make our GNFA, um, it's gonna keep it well-defined, but it's gonna make it harder to simulate on our part. 
which is why we're not going to do that. Um, and then, of course, last bit of this definition, Q start and Q accept are. And accept, denote, restart, and accept states. So this is our full definition of a GNFA. And we'll say that a GNFA accepts a string W equals W1, W2, dot, 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 WK, where each WI is a substring in the alphabet. So now instead of dividing our input into symbols, we're actually dividing it into strings because strings match regular expressions. Um, so our GNFA will accept a string W divided into some sequence of substrings. Um, if there exists a sequence of states Q0, Q1, dot, 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 QK, such that Q0 equals Q start, got to start at the start state, QK equals Q accept, got to end up at the accept state. And for each I in the set one through K, we have WI in the language RI, where RI is the regular expression that labels the transition from QI minus one to I. So RI is the regular expression. on the arrow from QI minus one to QI. And that is a bit of a mouthful. So I'm gonna go through it one more time. Our GNFA, when is it gonna accept this string? It's gonna accept any string W that can be broken down into substrings where each substring matches a regular expression in the right order. That's what we're doing here. Um, and how we write that down formally is we say, okay, there's got to be some sequence of states in our GNFA that starts with the start state, that ends with the accept state, and for every transition between two intermediate states, the label of that transition has to be a regular expression um, whose language includes WI. So it'll accept if W1 is a member of the language um, described by the regular expression from Q0 to Q1. W2, if W2 is a member of the language described by the regular expression on the transition from Q1 to Q2, and so on and so forth. So we have a perfectly good accepting definition in terms of our transition function that labels our edges with regular expressions. Um, so this is just another automaton, and we've just allowed regular expressions to label edges, and we have a special rule. Uh, and all this work is done in order that we can transform regular expressions, sorry, that we can transform DFAs into this and into regular expressions.
And don't worry, you don't need to remember every property of the GNFA off the top of your head in this proof. We'll call them out as we go through the proof and remember, oh yeah, we did define it that way. So we've defined a GNFA automaton with certain rules that recognizes a certain language. If we remember back to the first step of our proof that we could convert DFAs to equivalent regular expressions, we wanted to convert DFAs to GNFAs. So we'll show how to do that now. So now, how to convert a DFA into an equivalent GNFA. So first, let's let D be a DFA. Um, I guess that's not step one, that's just where we start. Uh, step one, we will add um, add an empty state arrow between any pair of states in our DFA the ordered pair. We'll add a null state arrow between any ordered pair of states in our DFA not linked by a transition. So for instance, if we had you know, a DFA that looked like this, I guess in this case, our alphabet would have to be just zero. So all of our edges are defined. Um, what we would do is um, create um, create a null transition back. And of course, if we remember how our GNFA works, um, we'll take this transition arrow, if and only if we see a string in the language that's captured by the regular expression on the transition arrow. Um, so adding null set arrows doesn't change anything. We're never gonna read in a string that's in the empty language. So this is just a formal thing to make sure we meet our special rule. Um, so we're adding these little meaningless edges um, to turn our DFA into a GNFA uh, and make it meet the special form, the special rule that we've made up for our GNFAs. Two, we'll create a new start state with no incoming arrow, with no incoming edges. connected by an epsilon arrow to the old start state. And by null set arrows to other states. So um, first we started by satisfying the requirement that any ordered pair of states is linked by a transition. Next, we started by satisfying the requirement that there is a single start state with no incoming edges. And we did this by taking our DFA, uh, creating a new start state, which we'll just call new start. With an epsilon error to the old start state, so we don't um, change the function of our DFA. Of course, now, yeah, it's no longer a DFA, but it'll be a GNFA anyway, so that's not a problem. And just to make sure we've met the completeness requirement, 
we'll add null set arrows as well. And then the last step is create a new end state to accept with epsilon arrows from the old end states. And incoming null transitions. So as an example of this, if we have some DFA we're converting that has some accept states, we're going to turn the accept states into regular states, and we're going to give them epsilon arrows to a new accept state to accept and to fulfill our completeness requirement, we'll add these meaningless null set arrows from other states. Um, and then finally, if there are multiple transitions, between any ordered pair of states, merge them with union. So what I mean by this is uh, our DFA might have transitions between states on different symbols. Of course, we only have one transition per symbol, but it would be totally reasonable to have two states connected like this with a transition arrow for A, one for B, and one for C. Uh, we've specified that we want exactly one transition between each ordered pair of states. So we would then convert this into a single transition on the pattern A union B union C, which is equivalent because uh, now we're transitioning if we see an A or if we see a B, or if we see a C. Um, so the result if this is our DFA D is we will have a new start state and a new accept state. Um, there will be exactly one start and exactly one accept. Uh, I claim that the start state has outgoing edges to every other state because we've defined it with null set edges. Same for the end state, we'll have incoming edges, which will be on the null set. All internal edges are defined. That's by step one, um, because we know there's at least one, at least one transition between any ordered pair of states, because if there wasn't, we added um, a null arrow. And there's at most one transition between any pair of states, because if there was more than one, we merged them with union. So the result is now we have a GNFA uh, that is arrows between each. I'll say one arrow. One arrow between each ordered pair of states. Um, except the start state, which has no incoming arrows. And the accept state. no outgoing arrows. And of course, all of my edges are labeled by regular expressions because any individual symbol, epsilon and the null set are all regular expressions by definition. And of course the union of regular expressions 
uh, that resulted from step four, these are also regular expressions. So now we have a conversion procedure. We're taking any DFA and turning it into a GNFA. So the last step, now that we can turn any DFA into a GNFA, we'll be turning a GNFA into a regular expression. Boil down a GNFA into an equivalent regular expression. All right. How can we do this? Why are GNFAs helpful? Why did we go to all of this trouble to create a new thing and show how to turn DFAs into it? Um, well, it's because GNFAs can be boiled down. And this is how. The idea here is that given any GNFA, we and remove one state at a time by combining transitions using regular expressions. So I'll define this in a moment, but the idea is that we'll pick some intermediate state and we'll show how to remove it. And then using regular expressions, we'll capture all the paths, all the computational paths that might have gone through it, and we'll assign them to other edges. So we'll create an equivalent GNFA with more complicated regular expressions on the labels, but fewer states. Um, and then I claim if we can do this over and over, once we have a two-state GNFA, we are done. And why is this? Well, suppose we have a two-state GNFA. By definition, it's got to be a start state going to an accept state. Like this is the only format of a two-state GNFA because we've specified there's got to be a start state, got to be an accept state, only one of each, and precisely one edge in between them, labeled by some regular expression R1. Um, And R1 is precisely the language recognized by this GNFA. If I start at my start state and I see some string that's not captured by R1, um, all branches of computation die or reject. Um, similarly, if I wind up at my accept state, well, by definition, I must have taken in one string that was in the language recognized by R1. So R1 is precisely the language recognized by this GNFA. And thus, after the boiling down process, we have an equivalent regular expression. It's just R1. So we're left with the problem of removing a generic state from a GNFA. So consider any pair of states, um, call them Q1 and Q2, and a third state, Q sub 
call it q sub rip that we want to rip out of our GNFA. So in particular, we'll select a state Q rip, an intermediate state that we want to rip out. And then we can consider any pair of states Q1 and Q2. Um, and I claim that if we're just looking at a little subpart, a little piece of our total GNFA, it contains Q1, Q2, and Q rip. Uh, by definition, there's transition from Q1 to Q2, or R4. Uh, one from Q1 to Q rip, R1. Maybe one from Q rip to itself. We haven't ruled that possibility out. Um, and maybe one from Q rip to Q2. Um, you know, there might be a transition from Q2 to Q1, uh, but we don't need to worry about it for now. The reason we're drawing this diagram is because we want to consider all of the ways that a computational path might get from Q1 to Q2, including through Q rip, right? Um, and we're going to take all those computational paths, every way of getting from Q1 to Q2, directly or including QRIP, and we're going to condense them into one regular expression. If we can do that for every pair of states that doesn't include QRIP, then we can take QRIP out, because any computational path that goes through it from one state to another uh, will be captured in some other edge. So our goal here is to remove Q sub RIP and replace R4 with a new regular expression. that captures all strings or computational paths that might have gone from Q1 to Q2 through QRIP. And I claim that the following gadget is equivalent to the picture above. So if you go from Q1 to Q2 um, through QRIP, you certainly might do it using a string from R4. That just takes you from Q1 to Q2. We want to leave that possibility in our GNFA. Or we might do it another way. Um, we might go from Q1 to Q rip along R1. We might use this loop R2 to stay in Q rip for some amount of time. And then we might read in a string from R3 that will take us from Q rip to Q2. So I claim that these two pictures are equivalent. In particular, I claim that if you have any string that takes you from Q1 to Q2 in the top picture, it also takes you from Q1 to Q2 in the bottom picture and vice versa. Um, if you go from Q1 to Q2 in the top picture, you either took R4 or you took R1, you took R2, some number of times, zero times, one time, two times, n times, and then you took R3, which means the string must be in the language R4 union, so or R1 plus some number of R2s plus R3. So these two pictures are equivalent. Um, therefore, if we perform 
this replacement operation for all state pairs q1 q2 not including q rip we have an equivalent G and F A with one fewer state. So you see what we're doing here? We're gonna draw out some big G and F A. We're gonna pick any intermediate state. That's not the start state or the accept state. We'll call that state Q rip. And then we will consider all pairs Q1, Q2, and replace the regular expression between Q1 and Q2 with um, this new one, R4 union, R1, R2 star, R3. At that point, um, our GNFA can recognize the exact same set of strings, even with Q rip removed. So we go from a GNFA with n states to a GNFA with n minus one states. And there is no limit to the number of times we can do that. We do it over and over and over until we only have two states left, at which point we can no longer um, remove an intermediate state. Once we're there, we have something that looks like this nice picture above with two states, and we are done. So what we have just done, uh, I've showed you with pictures how we take a generic DFA and turn it into a generic GNFA, and then how we take a GNFA and boil it down to a single regular expression that's equivalent to the language recognized by that GNFA. Um, we'll put it all together and write the formal proof now. And to recall, zooming out to the high, high level, what we're doing is we're showing how to turn um, any regular language into a regular expression and thus completing the proof that regular languages are exactly the languages described by the regular expressions. So let's put it all together. So, lemma two, as stated above, any DFA has an equivalent regular expression. Proof, let D be any DFA. First, we convert D to a GNFA. G and G has, um, G is a five tuple. So G equals Q, sigma, delta, Q start, and Q accept using the procedure sketched above. That is one, we add new start and accept states with no uh, incoming for the start state, outgoing for the accept state, edges, connected to the old start and accept states with epsilon edges. So this was step one of our conversion. We took a generic DFA 
we added a new start state and a new accept state, and we added epsilon edges um, to start converting this DFAD into a GNFAG. Um, that satisfied our special requirement that there was exactly one start and one accept state, and um, that there were no incoming transitions to the start state and no outgoing transitions from the accept state. We also add dummy null edges where necessary. So this allows us to satisfy the requirement that between any ordered pair of states, except for the exceptions of the start accept state we've discussed, there's precisely one transition between them labeled with a regular expression. Uh, remember that a null edge is never used. There are no strings that match, that fall into the null language. So this is just a technical requirement. And we also merge multiple edges between the same two states using union. So that's our procedure for turning our DFA into a GNFA that accepts the same language. And that was step one. Step two, uh, what we just did, Second, we repeatedly replace G with an equivalent G N F A G prime that has one fewer state. using the following procedure. Which we'll call convert G. And this procedure convert G will do exactly what we described above. Uh, it'll rip out the states um, doing what our picture did. So convert G. works as follows. So G is an input to this procedure. It's a GNFA. Um, suppose G has K states. Um, if we have at least three states, we can select some state to rip that's not up the start state or the accept state. And then we can let G prime equals Q prime, sigma, delta prime, Q start, Q accept. So this is our new GNFA, G prime. That'll be the same as G, but with one fewer state. Um, G prime is a new GNFA, such that Q prime is the original set of states minus Q rip, because of course that's the state we're removing from the state set. And um, for each for each pair QI QJ, such that QI is not the accept state, I'll write that. Should write that in notation QI is not Q accept and QJ 
is not to start. Define our new transition function as follows. We define delta prime of qi qj. Remember, this is a function that labels every transition between two states equals um, r1, r2 star, r3 union r4, where r1 is the transition between qi and q rip. R2 is the transition between Q rip and Q rip. R3 is the transition from Q rip to QJ. And R4 is the transition from QI to QJ. So just recall, this is the exact same as the little picture we drew above. We had our transitions um, labeled by the regular expressions R4, R1, R2, and R3. And we reasoned that replacing the transition from QI to QJ, which is exactly what we're doing, with the new regular expression, R1, R2 star, R3, union R4, uh, would give us um, a transition that would capture all of the transitions from QI to QJ through QRIP. All of those computational paths would get bundled into our one single transition. So this is just formally writing out the expression we defined above. Um, then return g prime. So this is a procedure that takes g, turns g into g prime with one fewer state. And of course, we can keep running this over and over. We also need to define uh, the case in which k equals 2. Because at a certain point, we plug in g, um, and g already has two states. Those two states must be the start state and the accept state and they must have a single transition between them labeled with a single regular expression. Um, so if k equals two, g looks like this. That is, with the GNFA with two states, start state and accept state, connected by some regular expression r, we return r. So we repeatedly replace g with an equivalent g NFA g prime that has one fewer state using the procedure convert g um, and then eventually we return regular expression r that is exactly the language recognized by G, which of course is exactly the language recognized by our original DNFA, DNFA, DFA, D. Whew. Well done. Um, if you have stuck with me through that proof, very impressed. That's a long proof with two big steps in the middle. Um, if some of it trickled out of your head as we went through it, that's also completely fine. Um, how I like to think about really complicated proofs is to break them down from the top iteratively. And even if I'm not keeping the finer details in my head at any moment, if I can remember the punchline, and I can remember the crucial components, 
I can then go back in and figure out how did those crucial components work. So our punchline is this. Punchline is a language is regular if and only if some regular expression evaluates to it, that is DFAs, NFAs, and regular expressions. Recognize or describe the same class of languages. Maybe with more or less states. Um, and if you wanted to go back and refresh your memory of this proof, um, you might recall that how we proved this was we started with a regular expression and we converted it to an NFA. That was one half of the proof. The other half was we went from a DFA to a GNFA to uh, a regular expression. So if you wanted to review this, you could take either of the, any of those parts by themselves and consider the individual steps. If you understand the overarching superstructure, then you can figure out the individual operations that make up our whole proof. So uh, take a 10 minute break after that one. If you're watching, grab a cup of coffee or something because we are gonna move on to a different topic afterwards. That is, we're going to think about languages that are not regular. So outside this big class that we've just essentially drawn a big circle around. So thank you for watching. Um, as always, if there are questions on this stuff, you can post them on Ed, and I will see you in the next part. Bye.